with us. We we will be waiting for Luqman, um, Sneem, and uh, Ahmed Abu Al Tama to be joining us. They're slightly late, but we're going to get started. Just before we get going, um, just wanted to say that you are all welcome to submit audience um, questions through Zoom's Q&A feature. So if you look at your screens, just at the bottom right of your screens, you will see a Q&A feature there and you can submit questions throughout the event. And then once we reach the Q&A section of the event, I will take your questions. For those of you who are um, joining us through live stream or by phone, you can submit your questions by emailing events at mei.edu, and that's events at mei.edu. Um, uh, basically, I will be giving each speaker about seven, five to seven minutes to speak, and then might ask them several questions, and then we'll move on to the Q&A section uh, at the very end. So um, we will start with uh, Zahra, uh, Zahra Ali, who's joining us today. Um, from Brooklyn. Um, she's an assistant professor of sociology at Rutgers University. Um, her most recent book, Women and Gender in Iraq Between Nation Building and Fragmentation, is a study of Iraqi women's social, political activism, and um, feminisms. Um, Zahra will be speaking about Iraq today and the current status of civil society and women's rights movements in the country. Um, hi, Zahra. Thank you so much um, for joining. Over to you. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you to uh, the Middle East Institute for organizing this uh, conversation. It is really great to be engaging with the, with the great scholars and activists. Um, so um, I'm going to start with saying that we have experience in Iraq uh, since October 2019, a really unprecedented um, movement of protest, an unprecedented uprising, which is really uh, um, represent Iraqis uh, uh, opening a new page in Iraq's history. Ordinary Iraqis uh, uh, really uh, changing uh, uh, the core of, of Iraq's history, Iraq's contemporary uh, history. So the Iraqi uprising is a societal uprising. Uh, women took part to this uprising, women, young women, but also women from all ages. Um, and it's a societal uprising in the sense that um, uh, activists in the spaces, uh, the public spaces actually that they, they uh, uh, occupied, uh, so, uh, and I still occupying actually. So if you look at Tahrir Square in Baghdad or Sahat al-Habubi in al Nasri in the south of Iraq, all these public squares are still uh, occupied by protesters. And protesters in these square really uh, establish the society that they want. They are developing uh, um, um, new state forms, providing services, free services, education services, uh, cultural services uh, uh, to, um, to the society. They are uh, developing new codes of conduct in which actually gender norms and gender issues are very central. And I think here it's important to remind ourselves that the very first demonstration, the very first civil society protest that was organized in post-invasion, uh, in post-2003 Iraq, was a woman's protest. And it was specifically a protest um, against uh, uh, the questioning on sectarian lines of women's legal rights, women's legal rights in the form of the personal status code. Uh, it's important to remind ourselves that straight away after the, uh, uh, during even, I mean, the, the, the invasion and occupation, this political elite, this conservative sectarian political elite, uh, um, the, the one of the first measures that this uh, political elite that came from abroad, that were, you know, uh, uh, brought with the US, uh, led coalition forces, the first thing that they did is that they uh, uh, questioned the personal status code on sectarian basis. So they said, we don't want this personal status code that unites uh, um, Sin uh, Sunni and Shia Iraqis. We are going to abolish it and put in its place uh, uh, a sectarian-based personal status code. 
Um, so in, 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 for example, the form of, of uh, um, comparable to the one in Lebanon, for example. Uh, so, um, and this really, this muhasasa is at the core of the crisis of the post-2003, of course, the invasion itself, the occupation itself, uh, but really this, what we call in Iraq, al muhasasa system, the fact that the US-led coalition forces, uh, along with this new political elite that came to power in 2003, put in place a system, uh, a communal system, uh, so for the first time in Iraq's history, the political system is based on your religious, sectarian, or ethnic belonging rather than just on your citizenship, right? And, and this is, um, uh, I think that this is really at, at the core of, of what the protesters are, are addressing, right? Uh, but I think that the protesters all, and, and the uprising itself uh, uh, is not only revolting against the post-2003 era, but I would say as well, uh, um, it's a questioning of the post uh, 90s era. Uh, we have to remember as well that uh, the 90s was the imposition of the sanction. And it's really the sanctions, the U.S because really the U.S. administration played an incredible role in implementing these horrible sanctions that were really a form of war against the society that destroyed uh, the state. Uh, um, and so uh, because protesters are asking for functioning, for a functioning state, right, for functioning state services, uh, water, electricity, uh, uh, the health system, the education system, all of which have been destroyed since the sanctions. Um, and also the protesters are, are, are addressing political violence because one of the features of, of uh, the uprising is really its repression, its bloody repression by the Iraqi regime. Uh, we have more than 700 unarmed protesters uh, uh, killed that have been killed since October. Uh, and, and many of them in the very first weeks of the uprising, uh, often in, in really gruesome death, uh, uh, killed by a uh, tear gas canister, uh, piercing their bodies and even their, their heads. And we have more than 25,000 uh, uh, severely injured individuals and hundreds of detainees. And, and, and I guess this is also the main reason why um, protest, I mean, Baghdad is really under lockdown right now because of the COVID. But in the southern region of Iraq, in Al Basra, for example, uh, in Nasriya, we still, we are still having protests. Uh, uh, and most of the protests really emphasize on, on releasing, releasing uh, uh, an, an, um, unarmed protesters, protesters that were uh, detained and that nobody heard, uh, heard of. Uh, so really, uh, uh, I think the protesters are still emphasizing the necessity to obtain justice uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, for uh, the protesters that have been killed, detailed, tortured, and are still today, still uh, on an everyday basis, threatened by this regime that uh, uh, um, the uprising often call, or people who participate in the uprising often, often call a militia regime. Sure. So just um, thank you so much, Zahra, for that fantastic uh, context. Um, just to kind of uh, look at the present day, if we fast forward to the present day, um, Obviously, there are so many different um, variables uh, that may have impacted the protests, and coronavirus is, is one of them. And looking at other developments, such as um, the, the new prime minister, Mustafa Al-Qadhimi, who I think in, in the press is being depicted as this like yeah. you know, aggressive um, Western-style uh, leader, mm -hmm. according to the New York Times, at least, because he shows up to appointments on time and uses uh, uh, sanitizer. He's, uh, he's a Western-style <laughs> leader. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to get some thoughts, you know, given the current context and all of those variables and any political changes that you feel mm -hmm. might have impacted these movements. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question. So um, uh, I'd like to also mention the fact that uh, protesters really, um, uh, they, they uh, basically set up a list of demands, right? And among the list of demands, there was the re reappointment of uh, a new uh, prime minister, uh, the organizations of... Uh, um, uh, parliamentary elections, uh, the uh, writing of a new constitution. And so the uh, uh, reappointment of al Kazami was uh, part of, of, of this. However, the protesters also uh, demanded, uh, uh, they, th there was a series of, of 10 points basically that the, the prime minister should, uh, should or should not be basically, should not have a two citizenships or basically should not, the, the, the individual should not come from uh, the opposition of the regime that was living abroad. Uh, uh, 
and uh, the, this individual should uh, have not participated in 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 the the, the post 2003 regime, etc. Um, and and the the responses since the appointment of Al Kadhimi uh, have been, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, heterogeneous. Some protesters are saying that, and there's also an, an inner contradiction, and I think I can also co compare it to the Lebanese context, right? Mm -hmm. There's an inner contradiction uh, with the fact that you have a protest movement that is asking a regime that it is questioning to appoint uh, uh, a non-corrupt and non-sectarian uh, government uh, and prime minister. So, this inner contradiction is a contradiction that will carry on, I think. And, and mm -hmm. we are aware, and as a sociologist uh, um, studying this protest, I'm aware of the fact that it is a very long process that is just starting. And mm -hmm. what's on the ground is being discussed. And of course, uh, protesters refused any form of representation uh, in order not uh, to, to avoid any appropriation by any side uh, or you know, any, any groups. Uh, but the, the discussion that is happening on the ground is, well, if we are asking for um, uh, elections, now we need to organize, now we need to set up an uh, electoral list with independent, non-corrupt, non-sectarian individuals. So part of, uh, I would say, uh, the civil society um, activists, also some of those who have launched the protest that was prior to the uprising in, from 2015 or the 2018 protest, are uh, um, um, considering that there are positive changes within El Kadhimi, and others are saying that, uh, uh, that, that they refuse El Kadhimi. So there, there, are, there are different positions around his appointment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perhaps we can get back to, um, to coronavirus in a bit. I think it's, it's affected sure. different countries and different movements in different ways. Um, I'd like to move on. I'd like to segue um, to Lebanon, since um, you mentioned Lebanon several times, and oftentimes there are parallels drawn between Iraq and Lebanon. And uh, Lokman Sneem has just joined us. Lokman, are you, um, are you there? I see that you're not on video anymore. Um, you're on mute as well if you're trying to speak. OK. Um, we will move on to Razan Razawi and then um, try to get back to Alokman. Um, thank you, uh, Razan, for joining us today. Um, Razan is a Syrian Palestinian um, blogger and a PhD student at Sussex University in the United Kingdom. She's joining us today from Chicago, where she's been for a while. Um, she's, an, she's also an activist who advocates for um, journalists and bloggers under threat in Syria and the rest of the Arab world. She specializes in minority rights, including LGBT um, rights in the Arab world, the rights of Palestinians as well. Um, she'll be speaking today about protests in Syria um, and how these protests are non-binary in the political sense. Welcome, Razan. Thank you so much for joining us. You are on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Zahra. Um, and it's, it's been great to be part of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to just um, start right away. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, really five points about um, five areas um, now witnessing protest in Syria, um, starting with Dar'a, Idlib, Afrin, Occupy, Jolan, and Sueda. So uh, my first point I want to say is that these protests, uh, that the protesters are protesting a new political and socioeconomic reality that was imposed by the Syrian state and by Russia, Iran, and Turkey, who are now controlling Syrian self-determination. Second, the demand to release the detainees is still a central demand that can be heard clearly across these protests, whether in Afrin, Idlib, Dar'a, Sueda, or Jolan, which invites us to rethink our understanding of detention and prison beyond the centrality of the Syrian state, which also brings to mind the much needed work by black American feminists and theorists like Angela Davis and Ruth Gilmore on abolition and how could this work benefit the Syrian future. Third point I wanna mention is that each of these protests speak of different community struggle where communities are protesting different authorities in their area. 
So for example, people in Afrin protest Turkish-backed militia, and in Idlib, they protest HDS, where in, whereas in, in Dara and Sweda, they're protesting Assad and allies. In Jolan, they're protesting both of Assad and Israel. These protests and solidarity protests are significant in how they challenge analysis of essentialist notions of sectarianism in Syria, and they also challenge authoritarian, colonial, and partition geographies. The fifth point I wanted to mention is that these protests are also non-binary. And non-binary, and I mean that these protests occupy spaces that flee state, opposition binary, and polarization. And this is quite important for the Syrian future for several reasons. The protesters in Busra al-Sham occupy unique locations, being ex-rebels and now army men. This non-binary location of being neither Assadist nor rebel is the new political subjectivity that we are witnessing and seeing protesting in the ground today. At least in Dara and Sweda, both of which are under the state regime control. So in Sweda, protesting there were, uh, protesters there were shamed as monitorian or being part of the minorities for refusing to join the militarization of the uprising. These political subjectivities, whether in Dara or Sweda, whether being an ex-rebel who joined the Syrian army or a Druze protester who refused to, to uh, the militarization of the uprising were excluded from the 2000 revolution. And in this sense, perhaps the, two, the 2020 protest could also be understood as a protest against the 2011 uprising itself. I argue that these protests reflect the need for new sociopolitical imaginaries beyond the state and the opposition. It's important to remember that non-binary political subjectivities have been evident on the ground since 2011 or before. It's not likely, it's not like they came back or that today's protests are renewed re revolution or even continued revolution. Rather, I would like to use revolutionaries' very terminology, Ramadiyin, and say that these protests could actually actually be Ramadiyin protest or a gray protest. Ramadi means gray and the Ramadi is someone revolutionary who is excluded by the revolutionary because they're considered not revolutionary enough. So in order to flee this linguistic pluralism, I will not use gray here, but instead I will call these protests non-binary protests. So the non-binary protest then tells us about different paths and ima imagine new possibilities, different futures from the ones that were offered by the state and by the opposition in diaspora or even inside the country. As one protester from Sweda tweeted recently, and I quote, we weren't scared, we just did not want militarization and we did not want extremism, end quote. So it is in this conscious decision to protest peacefully, knowing now after nine years of live example where the militarized protest will, make, will take this youth protester, is what I call non-binary political position in Syria today, of being neither Assadist nor militarized opposition. With these words, it is important to reflect, especially from exile and diaspora locations, and not repeat past mistakes, my mistakes included, we should invest in local communities in Idlib, Dara, Sweda, and other areas across Syria, rather than support sanctioned policies that harm and divide communities. Finally, I would like to end my, quote, my talk with a quote from Angela Davis as a reminder of the contribution of non-binaries <laughs> in imagining a future that escapes rigid binaries and, ba and, and, and boundaries of identities. I quote, I don't think we should, we would be where we are today without, I'm sorry, I don't think we would be, we are where we are today, encouraging ever target numbers of people to think within an abolitionist frame had not be the non-binary and trans community taught us that it is possible to effectively challenge that which is considered the very foundation of our sense of normalcy. So if it's possible to challenge the gender binary, then it certainly can effectively, we can resist prisons, jails, and police. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Roseanne. That was fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions pertaining to what you just said. There's so much in there, but I'd like to kind of take the conversation a little bit um, towards uh, the actual uh, subject of the of the panel or the way that it was framed, which is solidarity movements, not just within the Arab world, but also outside of the Arab world, especially now in light of what's happening in the United States and protests, Black Lives Matter protests, um, following the, the brutal uh, murder of George Floyd. And in Syria in particular, we've seen um, murals and other dedications in solidarity with George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was wondering in your opinion, given everything you've just said, what the significance of these movements are and how demands um, for security sector reform and greater civil rights are comparable in Syria to what is happening in the United States. I always hesitate to draw these parallels because sometimes they can feel very strained, but it would be interesting to get your views on whether or not you do see any at all. Yeah, actually, exactly. I mean, I, I personally am still exploring that connection. And I don't think it's okay sometimes not to know exactly um, to appreciate the moment, but trying to explore that connection. Um, but I, I personally, this is why I, I mentioned um, abolitionist work in my talk is because I do see that that abolitionist um, theory could actually be beneficial uh, for the Syrian future specifically. And like, that's why I kind of focused on incarceration and I'm working on incarceration myself and how it's been formulated because especially in the context today we're witnessing a lot of um, um, like uh, accountability have been made to people who've been uh, torturing detainees in Germany and other um, uh, courts. Um, so I do think this is a, a, a maybe a bit too soon to talk about like um, practically how could this we see it today but I think it's um, I do feel personally that abolition is 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 a is an area of exploration, um, and I do think that because uh, there 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 has been these protests um, in Idlib, um, not to not just to kind of let the people protesters in Idlib do that kind of solidarity work, but us as people who are exiled in diaspora, we need to extend that work uh, to talk more about less. Um, kind of performative um, uh, solidarity and more actually tangible and meaningful in addressing, for example, anti-blackness in our communities um, and also enjoying these connections and our, our work as scholars and educators and organizers. Um, so I think this is this is the area that I feel that and I see some people working on um, and, and I think it's this conversation starts just started. Great, thank you, Razan. And actually, this is a good segue to my next question for you, which is on Syrian civil society. I mean, how do you find uh, that it's it's operating, it's continuing to operate today, and especially in the diaspora? I think that um, today um, we are, we're lucky, I guess, in a way to kind of have online streaming panels uh, in Brussels conference today. And they, we have a lot of uh, uh, like representatives from the civil society. Um, I know Maimoun al-Amar was speaking yesterday and I missed her speech and I wanted to, to go back to her. Um, there's a lot of amazing people uh, talking already today and we can all of, the, all of us look, listen to what they're saying. I do want to say that I am personally, I'm in touch with some and, and and they're facing extraordinary, extraordinary um, difficulties today. And I wanted to actually kind of talk about civil society from a grassroots and also community organizing work, like to, to, to kind of connect it to the talk that I was talking about is that these opportunities that these protests in Bara, these protests in Idlib, in Jolan, in Sueda, these are opportunities of engagement. These are opportunities for us to amplify these voices, to see what are their demands, what, what kind of work can be done, what how we can support. And this is these opportunities and allow us to think about way of, of solidarity from overseas, a way of bridging the diaspora community to the people inside, the, inside, the, inside Syria, but also extend it to the exiled community, Syrian exiled community. Um, so I feel like, you know, uh, uh, to kind of think about positionality um, and also think about how my work is actually beneficial to the community I'm working with, because this is very important. And I, and I do think that this, this work has already been done by so many uh, uh, excellent work being done in the civil society. Great, thank you so much, Razan. That was fantastic. Um, I might get back to a couple of points that you mentioned, but just after um, we introduce uh, Lokman. Lokman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, I know, you. Um, thank you. I know you've had some connectivity issues, which is not surprising. Uh, exactly. Given 
you are in Lebanon, I am Lebanese and can relate to that very much. <laughs> um, so Luqman Slim is a Beirut-based director of Haya Bina, which is a Lebanese civic initiative promoting citizen involvement in the political process and opposing Lebanon's sectarian system. And he, and also um, you're a director at Omam, I believe, a Lebanese organization that focuses on Shia politics and social dynamics. He will be speaking to us today about the current dynamics in Lebanon, which are very uh, dear to my heart, um, and uh, protests and demands there. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Luqman. Please uh, take thank, it away. Thank you, Zahra. And as you said, I'm sorry that I cannot, that you cannot see me, but it's uh, a sign of uh, the times. The country, as you all know, is going through let's say, one of the hardest moments uh, of its uh, history. So let's go back a little bit uh, to what started in Lebanon on October 17, 2019. As you remember, perhaps the protests that evening started because of a tax that the government wanted to impose on WhatsApp and other VOIPs applications already imposing this tax uh, said uh, clearly that uh, the state is in dear need of finally more resources. Uh, okay, now we are at a day where Lebanon as a state uh, defaulted officially. Uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, we have uh, all the problems imaginable uh, and non-imaginable, electricity, water, internet. However, all this should not uh, finally hide the real issues. Starting uh, uh, from day one, let's say there was a kind of underlying debate uh, about what brought the country to this break up point. Is it Finally, only the corruption, the failure, the ill-functioning of the judiciary, uh, the clientelist system, or is there another uh, deeper, in a way, uh, reason, which is the fact that Lebanon, small country enclaved between Israel, former Syria, and the Mediterranean, is actually run by what we call the state and the non-state, I mean Hezbollah. Uh, of course, you know, this debate went up and down. Sometimes I would say the party or happening like of the demonstrations which took place in uh, downtown Beirut and other squares in the regions, you know, hit. Uh, this debate, and we saw people focusing more on their social uh, revendication. However, bit by bit, and with the financial collapse of our economy and of our uh, fiscal system and financial system, uh, there was a kind of a spontaneous uh, drift towards a, a review of the uh, reasons which brought the country to this point and uh, starting from uh, let's say beginning June we uh, are witnessing uh, political slogans competing with social slogans and while the social slogans were uh, focusing on good governance and fighting corruption nowadays it's uh, becoming more or less uh, uh, very steady to see also demonstrators calling for the full application of the international uh, UNSC resolution claiming uh, the disarmament of Hezbollah, claiming the closure of the borders between Lebanon and Syria, which are uh, not uh, fully controlled by the state. So I can say that in a way we are, in spite of the uh, dramatic situation that we are living, that we are finally uh, very lucky because it didn't take Lebanon a lot of time 
uh, to, let's say, uh, it didn't take us a lot of time to see unfolding this set of uh, challenges which are facing uh, the country. When it comes to the protests per se, obviously the nature of the protests have changed according to the uh, changes which uh, amended the, 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 the slogans and the mottos. So nowadays, at, nowadays we see much more uh, slogans and let's say protestation, which uh, try to bring together uh, regional issues or issues connected to a certain region, uh, rather than exclusively national uh, or uh, national slogans, which could represent a kind of uh, common ground. I think that nowadays we are finally again in a kind of uh, middle way. Uh, we are in the middle way uh, because finally the government of Mr. Hassan Diab, which is today officially running the country, is still uh, sticking uh, to some an outdated uh, explanation of all what's happening, still resorting to conspiracy theories to explain why people are in the streets and why people uh, are so uh, tough in their uh, approach to the government. And uh, we are lucky also because suddenly uh, the, 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 the problems of the country that Hezbollah succeeded hiding in a way uh, thanks to the argument uh, fighting terrorism and thanks to the argument uh, preserving the stability are uh, falling apart. Objectively, they are falling apart. So the main issue nowadays is what to do uh, and what could the, and how should the international community uh, finally behave. I think that, you know, one of the lessons learned of what started on October 17 is that the policy of maintaining the stability of Lebanon at any price under the pretext that uh, bothering this stability will push uh, mil hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees from the eastern shores of the Mediterranean to the western shore has proved its failure. So today, uh, no, uh, today it's clear that uh, funding the stability as it was the case over the last years is not the uh, good recipe. Sure. Uh, obviously, it means that we need to think uh, outside the box, and everyone is invited to think outside the box. In Lebanon, I think that the exercise is being done. Uh, we can, you know, it's, it's no more uh, surprising to uh, see people discussing again about uh, the constitution of Ta'if. Shall we keep it? Shall we amend it? Uh, uh, I mean, the debate is getting more and more taboo-free, uh, but uh, I think that the Lebanese need to be uh, helped in this, uh, in this uh, enterprise. And I would say to conclude that the best way to help the Lebanese today is not to help the Lebanese state and not to fear that the collapse of the country keeps going on. Thank you so much, Lukma. I have so many questions for you, but I'm cognizant of time. So I'm just gonna limit it to one. 
Um, you wrote in late 2019 that despite the similarities between ongoing protests in Shia majority areas of Lebanon and Iraq, patience is needed in determining whether they are part of a larger regional uprising against Shia political leaders and Iranian interference. I know you teased at that point a little bit in what you just said, but I'm wondering that since it's now been six months since you said that, how you feel about that statement and is it still too soon? No, I think that you know, uh, things finally, despite uh, the facade, are moving forward. And as much people are connecting the poor conditions of their daily living to the political item, which is the control of Hezbollah of the state, uh, the movement within the Shia milieu and let's say the anger within the Shia milieu is growing and is getting more and more outspoken. Let me just illustrate this by uh, what happened uh, a couple weeks ago when a youngster just tweeted that instead of uh, providing electricity to the house of Nabih Birri, the Speaker of the Parliament, provided to all those who didn't have electricity. And this uh, tweet of perhaps 10 words caused a whole fuss in the country because the guy got beaten by the, uh, uh, by the uh, Amal guys. And uh, this incident turned into a big scandal. So today, I am quite confident that we are living the end of a Shia era in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Iran. It will take time. For sure, it will take time. It will not always be Pacific. We saw that. Uh, we saw that in the streets of Tehran. We saw that in Baghdad. We are seeing it on and off in Beirut. But I am quite confident that a Shia era of hubris is ending. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lokman, for that. Um, I'd like to address one question uh, to all of you before I move on to some great questions that we have from the audience. Um, and also to bring this again back to the subject uh, matter of the panel or one angle of the panel, which is um, solidarity also with um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and protest there. And I mean, we I feel that the protests have forced so many people in the region to examine racism within within our own societies. And that, as I you hinted at that as well. I mean, just looking at the racism against darker skinned Arabs or black Arabs and also the kafala system, particularly in Lebanon and Luqman, I'm sure you know a lot about that. Um, would anyone like to comment on the importance of examining our own societies in this way and expressing solidarity with the black community um, in America? Um, while some actually turn away from um, the, the issues of, of racism that we see in our own communities in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Please go yes. ahead. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, I, I'll have a lot of things to say. I mean, especially because I'm based in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, and I do agree very much with uh, Razan. And, and, and we actually started a conversation with people living in New York around this issue. Because uh, many of us have been uh, um, participating to certain protests as individuals, and we were reflecting on the fact that um, there is a ref uh, really, uh, we have to actually seize the moment, right? And a prizing is really an opportunity for us to uh, um, um, engage. Uh, so engage uh, um, uh, whether it's happening here or elsewhere. But I, I guess because I've, I, I, I live here, um, we have started a conversation with we are starting a conversation around, of course, racism, uh, uh, um, so black racism within Arab communities. But I guess also the, the debate is different and I think it, it's complex. It's easy to say that diaspora diasporas have a role, uh, but I think it's very, very complex. Uh, and and um, positionality is definitely central. Um, and um, so... The, I think the black race, racism within, for example, Arab communities uh, in, in the US or, or, or elsewhere in the diaspora is something 
slightly different or that we should problematize or, or, or think differently from, from the racism within, for example, Iraq. And in the case of Iraq, I will, um, uh, I think it's important to talk about Afro-Iraqis. Uh, and when I was doing field work in El Basra, actually, I met with uh, a group of Afro-Iraqis that started uh, a, a network uh, to um, um, advocate for Afro-Iraqis' right. And they were uh, really uh, repressed. And, and even among the civil society in Iraq, uh, there was very little solidarity uh, with uh, uh, with them, and they were also accused, and this is common. Uh, we know those of us who are familiar as activists or are analysts uh, of what happened with uh, anti-racist movements um, uh, all over the world is that they were accused to um, uh, create a form of separation and division, etc. So really, the debate is is not even starting. I think in Iraq, uh, um, um, and the the. the there, there was actually some reaction uh, to uh, George Floyd's uh, death in Iraq and uh, an invitation to open the conversation about anti-Black racism in Iraq. But it's, it's, it's really, uh, um, I think it's just a start and there's, there's a lot to do uh, around that. And I think as well, and this is the way perhaps I will put, I will, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this point, is perhaps um, in, in this reflection around positionality. Uh, but I think I think that beyond this kind of reflection, diaspora slash yani, people from a dakhil will kharaj, you know, outside and inside, it is an important conversation. However, I think that now what's going on, like even in our panel, we could have had people from Chile, uh, people from uh, the US, right? We could have had a panel engaging with uprisings and protests in, in, in Syria, Iraq, Sudan, or, uh, uh, Lebanon, and, and in, in the US. Uh, uh, and I think this perhaps should be a start. Uh, stop considering that there is this necessity to talk about the Middle East in and of itself, but actually uh, um, consider it as any other context. Sure. Thank you, Zahra. You touched on so many great points there. Um, I just wanted to do a quick time check. I'm very cognizant of time. I think we're going to run the session um, until uh, 15 past the hour to give us an extra half an hour. And I would love it if you could all stay with us because I would really like to get to your questions. Um, Ahmed has just joined us. So obviously would like to, um, uh, to turn to Ahmed. Um, welcome Ahmed, thank you so much for joining. Um, Ahmed Abu Artham. Yeah, correct? thank you Zahra. And I'm very sorry oh. for delaying. I uh, thought that the meeting at six or seven uh, Palestine time I didn't expect that it's uh, uh, earlier, so uh, I'm very sorry for the delay. Of course, Ahmed. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. It's Abu Artama, is that correct? Abu Artama, yeah. Yes. Okay. Bartema. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Ahmed is a Palestinian journalist and a peace activist, originally from Ar Ramla village in Palestine. He is the author of the book Organized Chaos, and his Facebook posts were instrumental in the 2018 Great March of Return, which I believe you were one of the founders of, Ahmed. Thank you so much for um, for suggesting the subject matter as well of what we were going to discuss today. So hopefully you can discuss a little bit on the Great March. The Great March of Return, but also um, Palestine's history of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, which we've just um, touched on now, um, seen most recently with solidarity uh, marches. So please uh, go ahead, Ahmed. Thank you again. Uh, and I'm sorry again. <laughs> I feel shy because I just came in the last maybe 15 minutes. Uh, I uh, Yes, the, the idea of the Great March of Return uh, itself is uh, a global idea. Uh, it has a human essence because when, when I posted about it first, then a lot of activists uh, started to uh, uh, to uh, react with this idea. Uh, it was about uh, a human principle, a global principle. Everyone, every person, everywhere uh, uh, know it and share it with the others. I saw and uh, I wrote on my first post that why not we be as a humans like birds? Why not? Why why are, why we are deprived from our uh, a normal uh, uh, right of freedom? Uh, 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 here in Gaza, we are uh, uh, we are exactly like uh, the people who live inside the prison. 
uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, walk freely, we cannot move freely. Then when I saw the birds near the siege, near the uh, fence, they can uh, uh, move freely. Then I suggested that we should, uh, 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 we should, uh, 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 we should uh, uh, shout uh, loudly around the world and say we want our uh, right and uh, uh, let us uh, uh, let us uh, live uh, let us struggle for our freedom and let us struggle uh, uh, for our dignity. Later, I visited the United States uh, and I met a lot of activists, including I met tens of the black people there and I visited Detroit and I visited also the office of Martin Luther King and I said for all the people that I met with them we have one struggle it's one struggle in Palestine in the United States in Iraq in Lebanon in uh, uh, Kurdistan everywhere it's one struggle we struggle for our freedom we struggle for our dignity it doesn't matter uh, what's your religion? What's your color? What's your ethnicity? This is the similarity between us as Palestinians and between the black people in this context. Uh, uh, Israel uh, treat, treats with us according to our ethnicity. You are, not, we are non-Jews. We are uh, 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 Palestinians, other ethnicity and other religion. So uh, it look at us with inferiority. The same problem in the United States with supremacy, with the uh, black people, because they have another color. So uh, it's one uh, essence, it's one problem that let us struggle all together, let us struggle to create a world or to be humble, to try to improve the, the, this world, the, then uh, all the people uh, 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 can be treated according to their humanity not according to their uh, 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 not according to their ethnicity to their color to, the, to their religion because those things the people didn't choose it but the man the the human being can choose his behavior can choose his morality can choose his work in the world but he he doesn't uh, choose if he's Palestinian or if he's a Jewish man so why I uh, why I prefer as you said in your introduction why I'm deprived as Ahmad as a Palestinian refugee why I'm deprived from going to Ramla my origin uh, 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 town it's only unfortunately for one reason because I'm non-Jews so Israel deprived me from going there but if I came, if I, wa wa if I was a Jewish man and I came here and I said that I want to go to my, uh, uh, to go to Ramla or to go to everywhere, I will be welcome. To, uh, uh, to, to, to be more clear, I don't have with, with the Jewish uh, at all uh, uh, the opposite. I have a lot of uh, Jewish friends, I met them. But my problem is with this discrimination between people according to things that they didn't choose it. Sure, thank you, Ahmed, um, for, for noting those sort of commonalities and also the universal, universality of sort of the struggles, the global struggles for, um, for human rights really um, and social justice. Uh, I wanted to actually get a little bit more specific here. A lot of people draw commonalities between police brutality specifically in the United States, and then the brutality of um, Israeli soldiers towards Palestinians. I mean, we, all, we saw actually shortly after um, George Floyd was killed, the, uh, the murder of Iyad al-Halla, as I'm sure you're, you're very much aware of. And also just yesterday, um, a young man called Ahmed Arakat was shot dead at a checkpoint in the West Bank. And if you could elaborate a little bit on the commonalities and that the, the people often discuss when bringing up police brutality, that would be um, interesting as well, if possible. Yeah, actually the, the, the situation here in Palestine is worse and worse than the situation with the black people. Because the black people, uh, they, they achieved a lot of goals. We, we know that there is the first uh, black uh, president, uh, Barack Obama, and uh, the, the, uh, at least uh, legally, the uh, racism in the United States, it's not legal. 
But here in Palestine, the problem that uh, Israel legitimizes the, the, its racism by the law, by the law. We are Palestinians. We are deprived. We, we, we suffer from the discrimination by the Israeli law. So then we, we are refugees. We, we are deprived from the freedom of movement. But the black people are not deprived from the uh, black, uh, uh, sorry, from the uh, freedom of movement. Uh, uh, at least theoretically and legally, any uh, black person can uh, 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 struggle and can get uh, uh, more uh, rights, uh, more social and economic and political rights. But Pal in Palestine, the situation is worse because there is a law, there is a racial law that it uh, stop us, it deprive us from Palestinian, from uh, the, the right of return for refugees, as example, from the, uh, 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 and we know now that the, the, the situation in, Ga uh, sorry, in the West Bank and also in Gaza with the uh, uh, walls, it's exactly like South Africa, like the apartheid in South Africa. We are South Africa. But uh, uh, despite this, I'm, uh, I'm interested. I, I think it's, uh, it works to make comparison between uh, our situation and the situation of the black people in the United States, because we want to bring the uh, similarities between the struggles around the world. Because we, uh, uh, and I, I, felt, I felt a lot of solidarity among the black people when I uh, uh, went to the, to the United States. And when I say that we are in the, in, in here in Palestine, our situation is worse. I didn't mean that, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to justify uh, uh, the, the injustice in the United States against, uh, or the racism against the, the, the black people because Every exa all example, uh, any example, any uh, 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 story, single story of the racism is uh, 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 we should uh, be decisive against it and struggle against it. I think yes, I think we should uh, 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 show more and more the similarities between all the peoples, uh, uh, including the black people and the Palestinians, all the people who. Uh, are victims uh, uh, under the uh, uh, victims of the racism uh, of the uh, occupation of the injustice even if the uh, of the uh, dictatorships like as example like we uh, see in the uh, arab countries so it's injustice uh, yeah. we, we we can we can name it uh, occupation we can name it racism we can name it expulsion we can name it uh, uh, anything but it's in its core it's uh, uh, injustice, and we, uh, we, we, it's, it's very uh, important to, to bring all the struggles and all the, all, the, all the causes of the peoples together, and focus on and the struggle together. How can we create a world more justice and more equality for everyone? Thanks. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for your comments. I'd like to move to the Q and A from the audience. Um, Matthew Smith, we took your uh, question. Sorry, before I would like to add one thing, Zahra. Oh, please go ahead, Lukman. No, just I would like to like, draw attention to another feature, I would say, in the, in the Arab world regarding the George Floyd episode. It's finally the hijacking of the police brutality. Uh, mainly by the Iranian and Iranian-funded propaganda in order to achieve a fair or in order to promote their anti-American agenda. So I would say there is the uh, positive sides, which are all these types of solidarity and uh, of longing towards uh, some uh, universalism, but also there is all the abuses and uh, there is all the abuses which are meant to achieve short-term uh, political gains. And I think that uh, though perhaps it's not the 
most uh, politically correct way to put it, but you know, we need to also understand that you know, the George Floyd uh, episode and what followed it was also uh, used in the yes. Arab world or in some parts of the Arab world to promote more discrimination rather than mm. less discrimination. Sure, Zahra, you wanted to say something. Just yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think it's a very important point, and I think uh, Lebanon and Iraq really speak to each other uh, on this topic. Um, it's true that actually um, the commonalities are that uh, if you look at every single protest that emerged in Iraq uh, since the uh, basically 2011, it always emerged after young men have been killed by the security forces or the militias. And it's true that in Iraq and, and protesters have been very vocal about the Iran-backed mercenaries and the fact that the Iraqi government is, is really a, a pro-Iran government. And this is definitely an important point. However, I think it's very important to keep the bigger picture. Uh, the ones who armed uh, uh, the, the Iraqi, uh, the current Iraqi regimes, and, and the connections with uh, you know the U.S. invasion occupation in relation to the very militarization of uh, the Iraqi regime and even I would say the Iraqi society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, under this name and under this this discourse of the war on terror, I think that that's very important. And this is maybe where and and I'll just say that and because I, I know we want to talk about other things, but this is maybe where I think that uh, the notion of transnational solidarity is also important in, uh, in, in and I use transnational uh, instead of international to really focus on the fact, and this is what feminists have been doing theoretically since decades, that we, we should shake nation state borders rather than actually, you know, uh, uh, support, uh, uh, I mean, uh, shake them theoretically and even in, in practice, right? What they mean in terms of, of no, normative, normativity you know, the norm of what, what it is to be a citizen of, of a so-called nation state, right? And I think that the relationship between, you know, racial, colonial, military capitalism here is very central. And, and, and as in the US, people are emphasizing on defending the police, we should as well uh, uh, really make very clear the relationship between the army, the US army and the US police, that, that, that really is a, a, a very uh, essential relationship between the two. Sure, thank you uh, both Zahra and Lokman for those comments. I was saying um, Matthew Smith asked a question about anti-blackness in the Arab community, and I think we've covered that. Um, I wanna go back to Razan. We have a question uh, from Yassin, um, who says the following, I've been following the Kurdish-led revolution in the North since 2012. They claim a third way policy, which is basically not allying with either the regime or the back then mainstream opposition. So to what extent is this terminology of non-binary similar or different? Razan, you're on mute. So the question is about um, which it, which area of protest? Kurdish-led revolution in the north since 2012 and, and how they're claiming a third way policy and do you find this to be non-binary in, in the way that you framed it before? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I also, um, when I was talking about non-binary, which is something actually I like to kind of explore really, um, this kind of concept and how to use it and limitations of using it as well. Like it's good to not, um, uh, uh, just to kind of, um, to think about concepts like that in every con in every context. So I'm, I'm just thinking really about this example. I do, I do think for me, um, what helps me to make a decision is to always differentiate between the decision or an opinion about something is to always um, think about people, protesters, and to differentiate protesters from um, governance, from elites, from um, new warlords, um, from any kind of officials that are emerging out of um, today's dynamics um, or like contested um, um, governments um, or, or groups. So in that sense, I would say a lot of the people who are living in, in, in Eastern, um, um, Northern, Northern, like North area, but in the Eastern area as well, um, they are also struggling between 
being um, attacked by Turkey, but at the same time being governed by uh, the administration. So I, I, I would see a lot of people struggle with um, pronouncing criticism against the administration. I'm talking about Rojava. Um, and at the same time, because of this, the, 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 the repetitive criticism and attacks, actually, I would say, um, against them from Turkish backed uh, uh, forces. Um, so, so I would I would actually say that there the what I mean by political uh, non-binary positions is that there's this political subjectivities that they find themselves trapped, uh, they find themselves um, um, not being represented, not being belonging to the, the the new reality, to new forms of power, to new forms of political identification. So I would say in that sense, when we're trying to differentiate between the protesters from the civilians, from those who govern them, this is when we can say that this is a kind of a, the, the trap is what I'm talking about. And I do think in that context, it is uh, talking about protester in that sense, if, that may, if, that, if that's clear. Thank you, Razan. Um, a question for uh, Zahra from Abigail. You mentioned Iraqi protesters' resistance to formal representation to avoid co-optation by other groups. Could you elaborate on the role, if any, of the Iraqi diaspora in the 2019 and ongoing protests and how this compares to previous Iraqi protests and political opposition movements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that will actually carry on the, po the point of, of, of the uh, shift, uh, the, the anti-Iran shift, I, I guess, because um, the main group, and, and, and again, I think the comparison with Lebanon and Hezbollah is very relevant here. Uh, the main group that the activists have been, and, and this is what happened in 2015, in the 2015 protest, uh, that, were, that was structurally, I think, different from, from the, the uprising that we, we have been experiencing since, since a few months. In the 2015 protest, um, there was an alliance between uh, a leftist group, uh, members of the Communist Party, and uh, mainly uh, the Sadris movement. Uh, that that is a movement that is doing what has been described in the sense that it is a movement that of course is is way more grassroots uh, and, and is, is coming from inside Iraq in relation to other Shia parties that came from the outside. However, really the Sadrist uh, uh, movement really appropriated uh, the protest and turned it into uh, then an electoral list that candidated for the 2018 election. And this is exactly, I mean, when we say we are afraid uh, from appropriation uh, in Iraq, what we're saying is that we are afraid from Sadrist appropriation. And, and, and uh, uh, um, something that is very interesting that happened now is that uh, Muqtada Sadr, just like uh, perhaps uh, Nasrallah, has never been that criticized. The, the, uh, I think that he is, I mean, the Sadrist movement is really losing a lot of its base. Not saying that it does, uh, it does not have any base. No, it still has a, a its use of the anti-imperialist rhetoric, its use of, of this rhetoric of al-muqawama is really uh, uh, something that uh, uh, they, they have been uh, you know, playing on uh, since, since 2003, but even more recently in this period. However, I think that less and less Iraqis are, I mean, um, uh, or, or I would say more and more aware of the fact that this is a really a big joke in the sense that uh, um, a political uh, movement that uh, participated in, in the post-2003 regime cannot now claim that it's part of, of, of a resistance against uh, the Americans. It's definitely collaborating. It's definitely part of the problem. And this is a significant shift that happened in, in, with the October uprising, a critique of political groups that were still considered part of somehow a certain form of, of opposition to the post-2003 regime. Sure, thank you. And we'll stay with you. We have a question from um, Mehmet, and he's asking about um, your views on Prime Minister Khadimi. I know you touched <laughs> on him before, but there seems yes. to be a lot of interest here. Do you feel that he um, will fulfill the expectations of protesters, um, mm. particularly keeping in mind the killing of, of hundreds of yeah, I mean, the really the pro prosecution uh, and, and really the judgment that, that actually the killers are put to justice is a very, isn't likely to happen with, with al Um because it's still part of the establishment. However, I don't want to deny the fact that there has been very interesting move made by al Qadami addressing civil society. So, for example, al Qadami uh, um, reached out to people who were representative. Uh, I mean, of course, the protests don't, don't have any representative, but figures of the protest, especially figures of the 2015, actually, protest. Uh, 
uh, that are part that are really important figure uh, figures of the Iraqi civil society. Uh, um, they have been proposed to be ministers of of, of uh, ministers of culture or of youth. So that's that's interesting. I mean, there, there has been some atten attempt to reach out to protesters to answer some of the demands. However, I mean, as I said, uh, uh, and I think that. Uh, um, many uh, um, activists, civil society activists in Iraq will agree with me. It's really a process that is just starting. There are some interesting uh, uh, developments and perhaps positive developments, but it is unlikely that the regime will reform itself or would actually sanction itself, mm -hmm. which is you know, what it is supposed to be if we want to prosecute the, the, the ones who are responsible for the killing of unarmed protesters. Thank you, Zahra. Um, I'm very glad that Nicola has asked a question on COVID-19 because I was planning on returning to that. Um, she says that we've seen how the COVID-19 uh, lockdown has had negative socioeconomic impacts all over the world, really, obviously not limited to any particular country, but she's specifically asking how this has affected protest movements. I think in Lebanon, there's quite an interesting dynamic there. Lokman, if you'd like to talk to us about that. Sure. No, I think that I would like to highlight at least. Uh, uh, first, let me comment on something that Zahra said, and that I would like to also to uh, support that. Yes, and all these pro-Iranian movements are going through a kind of what we can tag as a kind of ideological bankruptcy. You know, the ideology of so-called resistance and uh, is just dying out. And I think that uh, though they are still able here and there to uh, impose to mute the, 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 the anger of their respective constituencies, uh, things are going bit and bit uh, out of control. And when it comes to Lebanon, I would say that perhaps, perhaps the process will be quicker because over the last five years, Hezbollah finally went through three types of concomitant bleeding. First, the financial bleeding. Second, uh, the uh, bloody bleeding or the blood bleeding in Syria. And third, we are watching the ideological bleeding. So uh, yes, you no, know, all these uh, taboos related to uh, resistance are just uh, collapsing. Regarding uh, Corona, I would like to highlight uh, when it comes to Lebanon, two uh, main issues. First, how Corona uh, has been politicized from the very uh, early cases. Uh, which were registered in Lebanon. There was a debate, an interesting debate in Lebanon, where from uh, the first case of Corona, let's say, came, did it come from Iran or did it come from Rome? And I am not uh, using Rome and Qum, Qum Iran as metaphors. No, the debate in Lebanon went very quickly, very, very quickly, very sour and reflected uh, those sectarian slash political uh, fault lines which are today, uh, which are today fissuring Lebanon. So uh, this uh, debate uh, occupied, let's say, the first uh, weeks uh, of uh, the spread of Corona. Second, it was clear as Corona arrived or uh, to Lebanon almost uh, in parallel to the formation of a new government, the Hassan Diab government, that everyone knows is the government which was brought to office by Hezbollah. There was another kind of politicization, the use of Corona as a kind of security argument to disseminate, uh, to, to, uh, to finally end the protest. So very early, we saw a kind of uh, mixing between uh, suppressing uh, the, pro the, the protests politically and using the medical argument uh, in order to justify the police performances. Great, thank you so much, um, Lokman, for your observations there. 
Um, we have three questions that I don't think we can get to as we're at the end of time and each question is kind of a Pandora's box. So we would certainly need more than three minutes. So I just wanted to give um, the excellent panel an opportunity to make any additional remarks. If anyone has any comments on, on coronavirus as well, please go ahead. Um, and otherwise we can, we can end it. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? Uh, maybe Ahmed, you could tell us about you know how how is COVID in Palestine? How 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 are people experiencing it? Uh, yes, uh, you know because of the uh, reality of the Israeli occupation, we are not united uh, territory here, uh, and uh, Gaza uh, it's uh, uh, completely isolated from the rest of Palestine. We are here in Gaza. Uh, some people here uh, like joke. They make it uh, like joke that uh, finally, after 14 years of the blockade, uh, there is one uh, privilege for the blockade that it delay uh, the arriving of COVID-19 here. Because the people in Gaza, maybe uh, they are the less uh, uh, group around the world. They uh, move and they travel and uh, like this. So. The situation in Gaza uh, uh, relating to the COVID-19 is still uh, uh, under control. There are uh, uh, tens of uh, cases, but they are uh, completely isolating uh, when they come from the outside. But in the West Bank, the situation is very uh, difficult. Uh, now there are hundreds of uh, cases in uh, West Bank. Maybe be, uh, because uh, in the West Bank there is more uh, 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 connection with with uh, 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 our uh, uh, occupied lands, 1948 Israel. So uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the situation there is uh, very bad. Uh, but here in Gaza, uh, the situation if if the the COVID-19 uh, spread in Gaza, it will be uh, horrible because. There is no, uh, 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 because uh, the, the, uh, the, the medical uh, uh, sector here is collapsed completely. No medicine, no uh, enough hospitals, no, uh, th there is nothing. So we hope that the situation is still under control in Gaza. Thank you, Ahmed. That's unfortunately a grim place to end. Um, but I wanted to thank all of you um, for joining thank this you. fantastic panel discussion. Um, and yeah, I encourage everyone to follow everyone on social media and uh, you yeah. know, all, of, all of the panels doing such great work. And thank you also to the Middle East Institute. Have a wonderful Thank you very time. much. Thank you very much for organizing this panel. And I'm happy to stay in touch after this panel. Thank you, Ahmed. Mm. Thank you, Razan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.